Well, thank you so much, Molly. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the University of Minnesota's Early Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. As Molly said, I'm Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer, the founder and director of the center. We are very excited to be hosting as our speaker today, Jana Brown, who will share a presentation titled The Role of an End-of-Life Doula. End-of-life doulas provide non-medical holistic support and comfort to the dying person and their family. This may include education and guidance, as well as emotional, spiritual, or practical care from as early as initial diagnosis through bereavement. At the Bakken Center, we understand that death is part of the natural life cycle. We are offering new courses this fall, focusing on redefining end-of-life care and suffering and self-transformation. And in the past, we've had programming on living well and dying well. In today's webinar, you will learn about how this role is growing and how it can integrate with hospice and the medical team to support those at the end of life and their family members to transform the dying process. Janet Brown is an end of life doula and Zen Buddhist chaplain in training. In 2019, Janet left her 12 year career as associate director of the Minnesota based nonprofit Climate Generation to pursue heart-centered work as an end-of-life doula. She serves on the board of the Minnesota Death Collaborative and helps lead an end-of-life book discussion and a morning study group at the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center. Janet founded Good Death Doula in 2020 as a way to support those near the end of life and their families with intention, compassion, and deep listening to honor this sacred transition. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Mary Jo, and thank you, Molly. Um, I'm really grateful to be with all of you today, and I'm especially grateful for all the great work that um, the Earl Ebakin uh, Center for Spirituality and Healing does um, for just keeping us all centered and, uh, and present. And, and I'd like to take a moment to actually do that. Um, I know we've all been coming from different places, and uh, have probably already had busy mornings. So I'd really like to offer a short centering uh, before we get started. I welcome you to close your eyes if you're comfortable. Regardless of what you've had going on today, just arrive here. Feel yourself heavy in your chair. Feel your sits bones. Put your feet flat on the ground. Try to lengthen your spine a bit. Feel yourself getting longer. No compression on your lower back. Just do a quick body scan. Send your breath to any parts of your body that need some additional space. Your neck, your shoulders, your heart. We take about 22,000 breaths a day. Let's just be present for a couple of these. Notice like a wave, there is a beginning when you breathe in, a pause, and then an exhale. Don't try to change your breath. Just notice this beginning, the pause, and the exhale. For those of you in the Twin Cities, our air quality has been um, really poor. Yesterday, it was the worst in the United States. And a little better today, so it feels better taking a couple of deep breaths. But it really makes me think of those people who, um, in communities, have chronically bad air. So really acknowledge and welcome these breaths, these cleansing breaths, just a couple more. And I'd like you to place your right hand over your heart and your left hand on your belly and repeat to yourself, I am here. You are here. We are here. One more. I am here. You are here. We are here. One more big breath in and let it out with a sigh. Great. I invite you to open your eyes and when you're ready and let us come back together. And before we jump in, 
I'd love to know a little bit more about your knowledge and experience of end-of-life doulas. It's nice to see so many people from around, uh, around the Twin Cities, around the state, um, out of state. And I would love to, um, Molly is going to provide um, a short poll that uh, she will put in the, um, well, you actually just see it pop up on your screen. So a couple quick questions that I have for you. We'll do one question and then we'll do the second question. So first question is, have you heard of the role of an end-of-life doula? Either yes, no, or not sure. Have you heard of the role of an end-of-life doula? Let me just take a moment while you complete that. We'll just give people about five more seconds here. It looks like most have responded. Mm -hmm. All right, and I will now share the results. Great, so it looks like about 73% have heard of an end-of-life doula and about 27% have not. Um, wonderful, Molly, do you wanna put the second poll in as well? And the second poll is, have you worked with an end-of-life doula? Have you worked with an end-of-life doula? I'll just give people a couple more seconds here. Right. I will end the poll and share the results. Wonderful. So um, even though some of you have heard of an end-of-life doula, the ma vast majority, 92%, have not worked with one, and uh, but a few have, 7%. So wonderful. Thank you for that, Molly, and thanks to everyone for um, your willingness to, um, uh, to uh, participate. It just helps me understand kind of where people are at. And I'm going to share my screen. Molly, if you can just let me know if you can see that okay. Looks great. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, just before we jump in, I'd like to share just a couple quick stories. Um, it was just after the 4th of July, 1980. My mother, who was 39 at the time, had a bizarre car accident. An elderly gentleman had a heart attack and came across three lanes of traffic and hit her yellow AMC pacer. Due to her faulty seatbelt, she had, had her, uh, hit her chest on the steering wheel very hard. An x-ray a few days later showed she was filled with lung cancer. At first given one to three years, a second opinion from a wonderful female doctor at Methodist Hospital in Cleveland recognized the cancer was too far advanced and sat down with our family of five children, ages seven to 19, and said, your mother is dying. Take her home and love her. She died eight weeks later. Story number two, four and a half years ago, my sister-in-law, then 55, had been treated for multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma for five years, a cancer that attacks your bones from the inside out. She suffered with hundreds of fractures throughout her body. I had arrived to help support her homecoming after a CRISPR technology CAR T-cell bone marrow transplant that doctors were hoping would extend her life. She was released during the final days of the trial to come home and enter hospice. She died five days later. I tell these stories because they represent what many families experience dealing with life-limiting illness. Many of us are thrown into the deep end of the pool of caretaking with little or no experience of our complicated and disjointed healthcare system or an understanding of how poorly we do death in this country. So based on the polls, um, as we said, most of you have heard of an end of life doula, but many of you have not had the opportunity to work with one before. And I hope that this presentation will change that for you, or at least get you more comfortable with that. But before we jump into what is the role of an end of life doula, I thought it would be very important to answer the question of why. Why do you need an end of life doula? For those academics in the crowd, and I know there are a few of you, I encourage you to review the Lancet Commission on the Value of Death bringing death back into life. It was published in January of 2022, and it's a comprehensive analysis of the challenges we have navigating end of life in this country. I will quote a little of the introduction here. The story of dying in the 21st century is a story of paradox. 
While many people are overtreated in hospitals with families and communities relegated to the margins, still more remain undertreated, dying of preventable conditions and without access to basic pain relief. The unbalanced and contradictory picture of death and dying is the basis for this commission. How people die has changed radically over recent generations. Death comes later in life for many and dying is often prolonged. Death and dying have moved from a family and community setting to primarily the domain of health systems. Futile or potentially inappropriate treatment can continue into the last hours of life. The roles of family and communities have receded as death and dying have become unfamiliar and skills, traditions, and knowledge are lost. Philosophers and theologians from around the globe have recognized the value that death holds for human life. Death and life are bound together. Without death, there would be no life. Death allows new ideas and new ways. Death also reminds us, reminds us of our fragility and sameness. We all die. Caring for the dying is a gift, as some philosophers and many carers, both lay and professional, have recognized. Much of the value of death is no longer recognized in the modern world, but rediscovering this value can help care at the end of life and enhance living. So that's basically the basis for my talk today. Dr. Kucher, who has spent 25 years as a family practice doctor and eight years at the Mayo as hospice palliative care in the Southern region says, a cancer diagnosis in this country is like getting on a four lane highway with no exit ramp. He also quotes a study that shows 87% of people die having never been asked about what their hopes, their fears, and their wishes are. Many of you, myself included, believe that hospice will be there for us when it's our time or our loved one's time. But hospice has changed dramatically in this country. As Dr. Gregg has witnessed, 72% of hospices have been acquired by private firms in the last decade. A 2021 article from Cornell University reported that from 2012 to 2019, there was a 328% increase from private equity firms and a 57% increase in acquisitions from publicly traded corporations taking over hospices that were previously nonprofit. As Dr. Braun, author of the study stated, hospice care is considered to be a safe investment with a stable revenue stream. Hospice is now a $19 billion industry and the most profitable type of healthcare Medicare pays for. So what does this mean for families trying to get competent and compassionate care at end of life. As some of you know, hospice can be provided in home or in residential care. While 70% of people report their preference to die at home, managing this as a family can be daunting and exhausting. And residential hospice can be challenging to qualify for. I've worked with two clients in the last year who requested residential hospice and both were denied, saying they didn't meet the criteria of less than six months to live. Both died within a week. We've also seen a trend where larger hospitals are buying up hospices so that hospitalized patients will be moved to hospice just prior to death so that this does not impact the hospital's mortality rate. I want you to know that I deeply respect all of the care providers associated with hospice, the nurses, the aides, the social workers, the chaplains, the physical therapists, and others I have been lucky enough to work with have been wonderful yet all report the reality that both residential and in-home hospice struggle with staffing issues. Even with a hospice that is well-run and fully staffed, home hospice usually comes in only once a week. This leaves much of the work of caring for the dying person to a family members or friends. An end-of-life doula works with hospice to support the person who is dying and their family members. Last year, I worked with a woman who had two adult children caring for her mother, their, for their mother 24 seven. Hospice was only able to come once or right near the end twice a week for a very short 30 minute visit. I don't have to tell you, it was exhausting for family members. In addition to myself, we brought in two private health aides and were able to stagger these visits so that family members were able to get at least a break every day. For my sister-in-law, Working with a small independent nonprofit hospice, we were lucky enough to have a nurse and aide come every day for about 30 minutes to help with medication adjustments, bathing, and care. 
The other 23 and a half hours, we were mostly on our own caring for her, taking shifts with my brother. He would cover from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. And I would cover from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. so that I could be there when the nurse aid and aide arrived to help with physical care and medication adjustments. Gratefully, she had a dear friend who was a hospice worker and helped us set up a vigil space that was loving and welcoming and infused with her spirit. This was the first time I really understood what dying could look like. Despite, despite being a very hard death for someone far too young, it was a death that created a sacred space of love, of honoring, of music and friends and family. So what is the role of an end-of-life doula? As Mary Jo said, end-of-life doulas provide non-medical holistic support and comfort to the dying person and their family. This may include everything from education and guidance, as well as emotional, spiritual, or practical care, from as early as initial diagnosis through bereavement. Many doulas and death workers specialize in a myriad of areas. So these are just some of the things that I've listed, and I'll give you lots of resources at the end of where you can kind of explore um, if you're looking for some, somebody or a skill that, that is specific. But advanced care directives and legal support are a big part of this. There's many attorneys and uh, people who specialize in end-of-life concerns. Planning and organizing. For some, the biggest concern is not leaving a burden of things for their family members to go through. Legacy work, capturing your story for future generations. Vigil planning, what space do you wanna create? Music, candles, or scents, people you would like there, people who you definitely don't want there. You know, there's a few of them. <laughs> Spiritual support. Many times fear is the greatest challenge at end of life. The comfort care packet of every hospice includes anti-anxiety meds. But I have found that centering meditation, focus on breathing, or prayers from their faith tradition can provide comfort. Also talking through what fears they have. A woman I worked with was afraid she would see the priest who abused her as a child. It was heartbreaking that this was her biggest fear. We worked with this fear for several weeks until it loosened its grip for her. Support with family members and relationships. Family I worked with, the mother who was dying, had seven grown children and wasn't talking to four of them. Hadn't seen them in years. When I asked if this was hard for her, she said, it doesn't matter, they won't come. And I responded, perhaps you can extend the hand and give them the opportunity. Before she died, just a couple months later, all seven of her children came to visit her, many from far-flung international destinations. I know it gave her great peace, but it also gave her children peace. Body disposition. This is an incredible amount of choices from traditional burial, flame-based cremation to newer forms such as alkaline hydrolysis, first made legal in Minnesota. Alkaline hydrolysis is sometimes referred to as flameless cre cremation, water-based cremation, or green cremation. This process dissolves the bonds in the body's tissues and eventually yields a sterile, liquid combination of amino acids, peptides, salts, that here in Minnesota is released into the St. Croix River. Water-based cremation compared to traditional flame-based cremation uses about 90% less energy and about 35% uh, reduction in carbon emissions. We also have many other choices such as green burial, natural organic reduction, which is basically human composting, and doulas also talk through decisions such as organ donation or donating your body to science. And it's really just having those conversations that people don't always get to have. Celebrations of life, funerals and memorials. I have found that over the last um, time, that, well, I guess just to say the time that I've been working with people, more and more people do not have a church or a faith community and are not choosing traditional timeframes for acknowledging a death. Being able to provide a celebration of life that more closely honors the life of your loved one is important. Grief support. I just wrapped up a six week program for the Minnesota Zen Center on grief using Francis Weller's amazing book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. And what I really realized from this class is that we are all grieving deeply for so many things in our life. 
loss of jobs, relationships, the ambiguous loss of pandemic and climate change, loss of our animal companions, anticipatory grief from a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia. These are all things that fit outside of a normal grief group, but we are all feeling, we are all feeling these. In addition to the grief, that we experience many times, it can trigger these uh, uh, other griefs that we've had in our life, even from childhood or previous deaths that we've experienced. And just being aware of these triggers and helping people get the support that they need to deal with their loss. Anderson Cooper has created a beautiful and poignant podcast called All There Is. I really encourage you to listen to it and it is on the list of resources that I have for you. So Anderson Cooper recounts the recent loss of his mom as he goes through her possessions, while also processing the loss of his dad when he was 10 years old and his brother's suicide when he was 21. All of the items that his mother saved, like his dad's belts and the outfit his mom was wearing when his brother jumped from the apartment window, are reminders of this grief. Each episode, he interviews others who have experienced profound loss. In episode two with Stephen Colbert, who lost his dad, and two teenage brothers in an airplane crash when he was 10 years old. As Stephen said, I have learned to love the thing that I most wish had not happened. I'm gonna read that again. I have learned to love the thing that I most wish had not happened. Stephen goes on to say, it's a gift to exist and with existing comes suffering. There's no escaping that. If you are grateful for your life, you have to be grateful for it all. It makes me grateful that I've suffered so that I can understand the suffering of others. This is a gift. Oh, I'll say that's a gift. <laughs> and um, I know Stephen considers himself a Catholic, but um, that's a very Buddhist statement that he made there. And so obviously there's a lot of crossover. As Mary Jo said, I'm also a Buddhist chaplain in training. I'll be done in March of uh, next year. And I'm training with, um, lucky enough to be training with Roshi Joan Halifax at the Upaya Zen Center. And uh, the three tenets are really what I root my practice in. First developed by uh, Roshi Bernie Glassman of the Zen Peacemakers and taught by Roshi Joan. Uh, the first is, the three tenets um, are, the first is not knowing. Not knowing means letting go of fixed ideas about yourself and others. Not knowing involves deep listening. One of the first clients I worked with who knew that he was dying of his cancer, but recognized that his family and especially his, his wife were not ready to let go and wanted him to pursue treatment. And he said to me, I have to get on with the hard work of dying. I'm asking you to work with my family to bring them along. I don't have the energy to do that. Not knowing means we do not come prepared with answers or solutions. And I know this is especially hard for the medical world. The second tenet is bearing witness. Bearing witness to the joy and suffering of the world. Many times we can't change people's suffering. Yet we can provide our presence. We don't have to do anything, but be there for people at the end of life. And I can tell you, this is very hard in a society that is intent on doing something. As hard as this is, we must not turn away from the suffering. Compassionate action. Compassionate action arises from not knowing and bearing witness. Sometimes this may just be holding a hand, moistening a mouth, or massaging feet. And although these are rooted in Buddhism, I have found that many of my fellow doula doulas also follow these leads. As my friend and fellow doula Whitlock, also called doula Jane has stated, there is a moment when you turn toward death and if you're open to be transformed by it, everything changes. There is a moment when you turn toward death and if you're open to be transformed by it, everything changes. In our culture that is so actively denies death, using language such as battling, fighting, beating cancer's ass, it's counterculture to turn toward death and discover what we can learn from it and how to keep this impermanence as a way to be even more present in our lives, to not take tomorrow for granted. 
In her book, Being with Dying, Cultivating Compassion and Fearlessness in the Presence of Death, Roshi Joan Halifax says, the beautiful, difficult work of offering spiritual care to dying people has arisen in response to the fear-bound American version of the good death, a death that is too often life-denying, antiseptic, drugged up, tube entangled, institutionalized. Old age, sickness, and death do not have to be equated with suffering. We can live and practice in such a way that dying is a natural rite of passage, a completion of our life, and even the ultimate in liberation. Roshi Joan has an exercise in this same book where you imagine the worst possible death. It's hard to do. <laughs> it's, as she says, this is underlying just under our skin all the time. But she really makes you go through this process and asks you to feel what that feels like. Then she has a second question. How would you really want to die? I've done this exercise a number of times and I have found that my answer has changed. I always thought I wanted to die like my grandfather died. He had laid down for a nap with his dear dog, Mitzi, and he never woke up. But now I realize I'd like to have time to say goodbye to my family and my loved ones. So this is a very uh, profound exercise to do. And then Roshi Joan asks a third question. What are you doing to make this possible? What are we doing in our lives to make that possible? What are the intentions that we are setting? My organization is called Good Death Doula for a reason. I know this is a bit of an oxymoron. Most people wouldn't put good and death together. Some feel there's nothing good about death. My interpretation of a good death isn't the idea that everything will be perfect at the end of our lives, but that we have created intention around what our wishes are, that we have talked to our family about what we want and what we don't want, and that we've given our own impermanent space in our lives to step fully into living. As a 12 year cancer survivor myself, I feel this deeply and I try to remind myself daily that each day is a gift to not be taken for granted. In Buddhism, there is a wooden Han in every Zendo that has the saying, life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly and opportunity is lost. Let us awaken, awaken, do not squander your life. This is our daily reminder that death is always present and we're not separate from it. I've been working with a client for almost two years who has been uh, has a life-limiting illness. And as she said, I understand that all of us can die tomorrow, but I can see the exit sign more clearly. She said one of the blessings of this illness is that she never feels obligated to do anything she doesn't want to do. She wakes up and decides what would bring me joy today. And then she does it. Ironically, she said, this has been one of the happiest times of her life. There is an African proverb that says, when death finds you, make sure it finds you alive. I'm gonna come back to this and I'm actually gonna talk through our resources and references because I know um, that for many of you, since so many of you have not had an opportunity to work with an end of life doula, I wanna make sure you know where you can find this information and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers. So the Minnesota Death Collaborative, um, as uh, uh, Mary Jo mentioned, I am lucky enough to be on the steering committee of this great statewide organization. Um, lots of wonderful resources uh, that are available. I will just tell you, I'm also leading, our, helping lead <laughs> along with others, um, our committee to redo our website. And so eventually we will be redoing some of those resources and, um, and you will be able to have uh, searchable features for the, um, for the end of life doula. So check back in September um, and we will uh, have a new site ready for you. I also have a resource page that has been compiled jointly um, with my work at the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center. So many of these resources initially on the page are ones that are um, end of life uh, focused um, uh, in a Buddhist practice. 
But I can just tell you that many of the books and uh, many of the resources are applicable for anyone. And then there's also other resources on that page. So feel free to um, not only uh, use that page, but also, um, and these will all be sent out in an email. So don't feel like you have to go to all of these right now, but um, these will be sent out in the follow-up email from Molly. But um, also feel free to add to this. If you have found resources, podcasts, books, um, articles that you've liked, uh, that you find helpful, please feel free to add those on there. Uh, as I referred to the Lancet Commission on the Value of Death, bringing death back into life, um, it is a, a great uh, commission report. There's a wonderful TED talk from uh, my cohort, uh, Jane Whitlock, what I learned about life from death. The Journey Guide Project, I mentioned Dr. Greg Kucher, this is the work that he is doing, combining um, uh, body, mind, and spirit, uh, working with people um, with life-limiting illnesses or at end of life. It's a, it's a wonderful pilot project and I'm uh, looking forward to that being expanded um, beyond their, uh, the initial project. Uh, these are some of the articles that I mentioned. The hospice is being privatized. Um, patients want to die at home, but hospice care can be tough on families and the business of dying has never been more lucrative. Um, some of the things that I referenced earlier. So, with that, I'm going to come back and I would love to end our, um, just kind of this part of our discussion with a loving kindness meditation. This is something I do every day. Um, it has um, really, it actually was since George Floyd's murder uh, three years ago. And I led my team uh, who, who were all heartbroken all, as all of us were in a loving kindness meditation. and. Um, I have found that I've done it every day since, and it has literally transformed my life. So we're not going to go through the whole loving kindness meditation. I'll just tell you the process that normally you would go to if you through if you haven't done that. And that is first you send these loving kindness meditations to yourself, and you send it to a loved one. Then you send it out to um, somebody who is neutral, could be the mail carrier or somebody you saw in the grocery store. Uh, then you send it to somebody who you have a challenging relationship with, somebody who is maybe a difficult um, person in your life. Uh, then you send it out to everybody everywhere, um, all living sentient beings, and, um, and then bring it back to yourself again. But since we have somewhat limited time and I want to get to some of the questions that we have, I just want to take a moment and send this to yourself because many of you. Um, especially if you are caretakers of others, uh, we don't take time to do this for ourselves. So I want you just to recenter yourself. If you would like to close your eyes, feel welcome. If you would like to um, plant your feet on the floor. And again, just take a couple big breaths in. And out, feeling that ocean of breath. And I would like you to repeat these phrases three times to yourself. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be at peace. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be at peace. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe, may I be at peace. One more big breath in, let it out with a sigh. And let's come back together and I'll stop sharing. And I would love to entertain any questions that we have, Mary Jo and Molly. Well, Janet, first of all, I want to thank you. This was a very, very powerful presentation, mm -hmm. you know, on a topic that, you know, as you said so well, oftentimes, you know, people don't have a lot of information and maybe it's even a topic that they avoid. So really grateful for the the open, the enlightened way that, that you, you know, offered information today. There's a number of questions um, and I'm going to just begin with one. Somebody writes, 
that they're an international physician and back in their country, they still struggle with letting people go and caring for whole families in the process of a, the death of a loved one. And this person's thinking of, of becoming trained as an end-of-life doula while here. And the question is where to look for training courses to become an end-of-life doula. And several people have asked that question, wondering is there a formal training and certification for end-of-life doulas? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And, you know, I realized just before that I hadn't put that in my presentation, but I was hoping that would come up. And I can just say that I did my training at the International End of Life Doula Association. I would highly recommend. I think they do a very comprehensive training and a certification process that is um, that is rigorous. Um, and then also uh, on the Minnesota Death Collaborative website, there is a listing of lots of others, um, lots of other um, schools that are available. Um, uh, the Vermont program, I know a number of people who have gone through and have just loved it. So um, I will uh, make sure that Molly has that list of other resources um, of places for training because it feels like there's more and more, but I do think that um, Inelda is the, is the name of the organization that I um, did, but there's also the national and um, yes, yeah, so I think somebody just put it in the chat there too, but um, so there's, um, yeah, doula givers is another one that provides training. So there's a number that are out there that are very good programs. I would just encourage people to, um, to check out a couple of different programs and see what speaks to you. And, and, and for, I'm sure those programs vary. What's the you know average length of time for a program to become a death doula? And is it just didactic information? Is there also you know clinical practicum? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. So I, I think it it uh, it varies by program. But um, my program actually the initial training was. Uh, just a weekend long uh, training, which uh, I think I really fell back on my, I was actually a, um, I worked in a nursing home all through high school and college. I think I fell back on that training a lot. I think a lot of people came from, um, from nursing backgrounds or from uh, people who have worked with uh, elderly or have, have had other experience, but then you're required to work with five people and um, actually provide a case study. So I will just say there's lots of opportunities to also kind of hone those skills once you've gone through the initial training. And I know that my fellow uh, Jane Whitlock is on, the, um, is on the call right now. And she has a program that she is building at Providence Place, which is a skilled nursing facility in Minneapolis and is really trying to build a doula program in a larger healthcare system, which is uh, really, um, it's, it's really revolutionary. And so she's working with a lot of, of, um, of different people and, and, uh, you know, to help build their skills and help, um, you know, get them trained as an end of life doula and help get some experience. Because I think if people haven't done this work, I, I will tell you, most people come to this work, having dealt with a family member who is, um, or a friend, and, and actually having that experience. And many people I talk to, I probably much like any of the other doulas at the Minnesota Death Collaborative, I probably get one or two emails a week of people who are interested and almost all of them start by saying, I was with my mother when she died, or I was with my father when he died, or I had this profound experience being with my sibling when they died. So I think for, for many of us, um, you know, this is not a highly lucrative uh, industry. And so I think most of us come because it's heart-centered work. So, yeah, and I've noticed in the chat, there's lots of other ones that are being listed. So, um, so uh, uh, lots that, um, lots of other resources. And again, I'll include a list when I send my, um, some information to. So Janet, uh, there's a Molly. grouping of kind of what I would say, almost like operational questions, it, like, how does one go about finding a death doula? How do you access one? Um, you know, do people pay? And do they have to pay out of pocket? Or does health insurance, you know, sometimes cover this? And then are there appointments? Are there contracts? Mm -hmm. uh, is this like a private cottage industry, primarily, mm -hmm. that's emerging? Yes. Well, I think that's a great question. And what I kind of compare it to is this is what birth doulas were like 25 years ago. So yes, I do think it's a, I think it's a cottage industry. I think it's just kind of building. And, and again, I think it's being built out of necessity. 
I think that what, uh, you know, going back again to the why, it's because many people recognize when they get thrown into that deep end of the pool of caregiving that they don't have, they don't have enough support. So I think that's when people reach out. And I will say that's a little challenging sometimes because typically it's somebody who is near end of life and, and you're kind of scrambling to help people get set up. Um, I'll just give an example. My, my father-in-law uh, a month ago was golfing. Um, he's 87 years old. Uh, then he was not feeling well. He went to the uh, doctor because he thought he had some, you know, wasn't feeling great. He was diagnosed with pneumonia. So for a week, he was on antibiotics and thought that he um, was just not getting better, went back to the doctor and a different doctor said, did anybody talk to you about these nodules on your lungs? And short story, um, he was filled with cancer. He had stage four cancer in his lungs that had spread to his liver and his um, abdomen. And um, it was a scramble to try to get, you know, the, the things that he needed, because then they sent him home with no diagnosis, no final diagnosis, they were waiting for testing. Um, and I'd laugh just because it's like, just kind of shaking my head. And now he's doing great. He's 87, decided to go through chemo and um, uh, is, is actually managing really well. But without knowing what questions to ask, that's the big challenge. And so we were scrambling to get a bed, to get oxygen, to, you know, and just even being able to ask the questions of, um, you know, can we get a home health aid to come in? And we were told, oh, well, you can, but that wasn't in the initial plan. So, so I just kind of frame that because I think it's important to understand, like, trying to scramble at that time and get a, an end of life doula in place can be somewhat challenging. And many doulas do this work just because they love to do this work. And I, I can tell you that it's that people are chronically underpaid because many will say, I don't need to get paid. I just do it as a volunteer or as a, uh, like a, um, you know, I just want to do this because I really believe in the work and you can donate if you want to, but um, it's, it's all over the board. I do charge and I, it's not covered by insurance right now. I hope that that eventually will change. Um, but I think it's important to um, explore a couple different doulas and just kind of figure out what, what is a relationship and what is a fit for you. So that's where the Minnesota Death Collaborative comes in. And um, we have professional listing of, of doulas that lists kind of what their expertise is, much as I said earlier, many people specialize in all sorts of things. Some people do the legal piece of it. Some people are actually part of the vigil. Some people do more of the life story. Um, so I think it's important to look at a few and, and if you have questions, um, you know, always, you know, the, the doula community is pretty tight knit and that's what I love about it. And that's why we call it the collaborative is because we do collaborate with each other. So, well, thank you. For, thank you for that answer, Janet. There are so many questions about this whole area, area of sort of the finances. So I think you've clarified that people pay out of pocket, they pay privately. So at this point, insurance does not cover. You know, typically, if you're contracting with an end of life doula, is the cost based on how long the person lives, how many visits you make? I mean, how how is that? How is the fee determined? Yeah, that's, um, I think it depends on the actual doula that you're working with. But typically what I've seen a normal um, routine is, I'll give an example. I'm working long-term with somebody. So we meet every other week um, regularly for about an hour. So, so I bill for that time that we get a chance to, um, to connect and, and kind of work through everything. We're working through all the different components that we had talked about. So, um, so kind of getting a chance to kind of, and, and that I'll, I'll be honest, that's what a doula would like to do is have more time to work with people. The longer your ramp can be, um, and we don't do that well in this country. Many people go into hospice um, uh, days um, or a short period of time just before um, end of life. And, and that's really tragic because what happens is most people don't have the time to really prepare for and, and plan all of those things. So uh, the preference would be that we actually have time to work with people, that you have um, the, a chance to be able to ask all those questions that we talked about being so important to ask people. Um, but, but sometimes people have, I wanna go back to the question of cost because I know that's important for people. Usually what people have is a package, for instance, like if they know they're gonna be working with somebody um, just for a vigil, 
then usually they'll just kind of have a time period. And it's a vigil is a lot like a birth where you don't know how long it's going to take. Sometimes it can take, you know, uh, days, sometimes it can take weeks. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, it really depends on the situation, but, but typically what they'll do is kind of break it out by a package. And, um, and I think most people are very honest and for, you know, forward facing about what their fees would be if there are any, some people have contracts, some people don't. Um, I have done contracts at times, and I've also not done contracts when it's very quick and it's a matter of days and just coming in to help the family stabilize a little bit. So it's not my first priority. It's more just to like, let's get you the resources that you need right now. Okay. So Janet, how does the doula work with a hospice team? So if somebody actually has reimbursement for hospice and they have, let's just say home health care hospice, mm -hmm. how is the doula kind of just another part of that team? Is that an interface between the family and that team? I, I think it becomes both. A lot of times it is an interface. I, I can just say I've worked with a number of hospice workers from Hennepin, Hosp from Hennepin County Hospice and from other hospices. And many are, are thrilled to find out a doula is involved. And I think that many doulas want to work very you know, especially in Minnesota, I think in some other states, it seems like there might be some competition between doulas and hospice. I can guarantee you that's not the case here because we really want to work with hospices and be able to provide the best care for that person. And so, um, so really, um, I find working with a hospice that, you know, right away, I usually like to be there for that initial hospice visit, because many times people don't even know what hospice provides or what questions to ask, or what even like, you know, typically, and it's not unusual that a hospice can come in and they provide this big packet of information um, and the family is overwhelmed and nobody's sleeping and they don't even ever have time to go through that. And sometimes hospice will go through it, but a lot of times I think what um, an, an end of life doula will help with is let's talk first about what this hospice visit is going to be. And so You'll, they'll probably say they can come once a week. Let's push for twice a week because that's like, you, and, and if you push for these things, if you even know what to ask for, a lot of times there's, you know, there's a social worker, there's, there's physical therapy if that's needed, or there's um, a, a spiritual care that is, um, you know, for a chaplain. But a lot of times that's, that may not be offered if somebody doesn't even know to ask those questions. Or the other side of that is you're dealing with a situation where you're exhausted and you're like trying to process all of this information and you're dealing with your loved one and and you're only absorbing a, a very small fraction and so what an end-of-life doula can do is help kind of stabilize that a little bit and and say here's the most important things we need to worry about right now like let's let's talk through this let's make sure we can get as much care as we can coming in um let's make sure that um, we have the things that you need, uh, oxygen, make sure that you have a bed that's, that's available and hospice will set all these things up. So that's why as an end of life doula, we want to be working with hospice and have a good relationship with them. And then also staggering those visits so that, um, family members who want to care for their loved ones at home, which most people do, but it can be very, very exhausting and, and, um, uh, overwhelming. So usually what we'll do is I'll find out what day's hospice is coming in. So if they're there Monday and Wednesday, then I schedule Tuesday and Thursday, or we get, you know, uh, some other support to come in so that the family members can have a little break each, each week, um, or each day of the, of the week. So it really sounds, Janet, like, you know, part of the role is being a facilitator, a coach, a guide, an advocate, um, sort of all of those roles. Somebody else asks, how about the medical community? What's their response been? Um, are they even aware of death doulas to, so that they might talk to patients and their families about death doulas? Yeah, I, I, we're trying to kind of break down some of those barriers. I think our healthcare system is, um, you know, as many of you may know, is a kind of a big ship. It takes a lot to kind of turn it. But whenever I meet a hospice worker and they find out that I'm end of life doula, they seem to be really excited. Like, oh, good. The family has somebody who is kind of helping them navigate this. And so, um, and I have found that sometimes what happens is, you know, uh, the, the doula, because they may be seeing people more regularly kind of identify things right away. Um, so it'll be the type of, I'll just give one example. 
Um, there was somebody I was working with. This is a guy who was incredibly healthy and never even took Advil. And of course, um, when hospice came in, based on kind of what his, you know, what he was presenting with, they immediately started with a pretty high dose of narcotics. And, um, you know, and, and right away, we kind of like, I talked to the, the hospice worker and just said, is there any way for us to reduce that? That just seems like a really high dose, um, even though we are non-medical. Like, so we do not do anything with medication, but I could just tell by the way he was reacting that this was a challenge. And so, um, so working with them to just, you know, kind of report back, like, this is what I'm seeing, you know, he's the family, he wanted to be more alert. That was something he told us he wanted to be, he didn't want to be knocked out. And so you know, is that something where we can adjust this a little bit so that he can be more present for his family? And he wasn't reporting much pain. So, you know, that would just be one example. And again, probably not the best example because we're non-medical. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just really being there and observing and, um, and helping facilitate. And, and usually what I would do is go back to that packet that they brought and say, all right, now it's time to kind of talk through this part of it. Like, here's the other things we're seeing. And, and to talk through all the different stages of death, nobody really talks about um, that with us unless you experience it yourself. And so terminal agitation is a good example that usually just before somebody dies, they get this terminal agitation. They want to get up. They want to get out. This is when a lot of falls happen. And um, it's important for you to prepare for that and be aware that that might be a consideration. And um, you know, work with hospice to make sure that it's, um, you know, that, that we're doing everything possible to keep that person as safe as possible. Well, actually, the, the example you gave, Janet, really was a good example, even though it was medical. What it showed is how a death doula can help people even think of the questions to ask. Right. And that's, that's really, in fact, um, what you did. Mm -hmm. So somebody writes that um, as you have worked with people in the I can see the exit sign more clearly category, um, what's been most helpful for them? Yeah, well, I think, it, again, it all depends on what's important to that individual person. And that's why I think um, uh, intentional listening and compassionate listening is so important. So really getting a chance to talk to that person. The first thing we do when we sit down is go through what are your biggest concerns? What are your fears? What are your wishes? And I think, as um, Dr. Greg, I stated that, you know, 87% of people at end of life are never asked those questions. So just even getting a base for like, what are the things you're most worried about? I'm worried about my children. I'm worried about, you know, um, being alone. I don't have family members here. I'm worried about, um, you know, making sure that I have the support that I need when I need it. Um, so recognizing that, that, you know, in some cases we have to build a bigger team or, um, or do things you know, that would be supportive specifically for that, for that person. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just really deeply listening and, um, and then compassionate action that comes out of that. So helping people get the resources that they need and the support that they need. Um, it's interesting to me that even though I had experience um, with, you know, how to, having worked in a, in a um, nursing home for eight years, as I, as I said, um, through high school and college, I knew how to, you know, turn patients or, you know, I'm conscious about bed sores. I, you know, I kind of knew all of those things, but what I have found working with people over these last few years is that it's more about, um, spiritual and it's more about mental. And it's like, we're in our heads and we all have fears. We don't know what's on the other side of this. I don't know what's on the other side of this. It's, you know, we won't until we experience it ourselves. And so understanding that um, we're all going to have different experiences, different fears, uh, that we need to be able to be, to listen to that. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to be present for it. So somebody else writes, Janet, that um, it seems it would be good to work with an end-of-life doula as early as possible before the exit sign is clearly visible. <laughs> yes, people, it would. <laughs> do people work with you when they are not near death and do well, not have a life-limiting diagnosis? Yes, I can tell you a call I got the other day, which was very funny. Um, it was a woman who 
to be honest, is not that older, much older than me. Um, but she is, um, she is a single and, uh, and she said, Hey, I'm just working on my healthcare directive and I want to work with an end of life doula. So I'm going to put your name down. Is that okay? And I was like, wait, I haven't even met you. Like I, I, I need to know something about you, but she, it turns out she's perfectly healthy. She, um, you know, she's, uh, independent. She's still working, but she said, I just want to make sure that that is something that I have and that I have included. And, and so I said, well, that's great. Like, I'm, I'm really happy that that's the case. And I would love to get a chance to work with you. But I also want to get a chance to know you and meet you. Because I don't want to get pulled in at the last minute. What I'd love to do is get a chance to kind of understand those wishes and, and, um, and what your concerns are. And so that we can be on the same page and, and know where things are. So yes, I absolutely um, you know, I absolutely agree. And I think in other countries, we do a much better job at this of um, being in hospice for a longer period of time. And I think, you know, that, that word is really heavy. It carries a lot of weight. As soon as, you know, we mention the word hospice, many times people just go into this fear response. And I think the challenge is that we avoid that because we think it means death. And even extending hospice care you can actually live a better life and a higher quality of life for whatever time you have remaining. So I do encourage people that regardless of, um, of what that, you know, what that situation is, if you have access to hospice, take it. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's really important that, um, that people do that. And if, if you can, if you have the means or the ability to work with an end of life doula, do that. And if you don't have the means to do that, contact us and we will find somebody who can help support you. Because I think that is, um, again, it's not about uh, this being a high paid industry. It's really about helping support people when they need it. So Janet, there are so many rich questions that you know people are going to be incredibly grateful for the resources we're sending out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to you know offer you one final question, mm -hmm. and it's actually a big question, and and we only have a couple of <laughs> minutes left, <laughs> but but I'm sure you can offer some perspective. Somebody writes about. Um, can you say a little bit more about suffering and death, the purpose of suffering, helping the dying through it, and supporting the family? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, again, I don't want to emphasize that people need to be suffering at end of life because I don't think that's the case. We can, we have the ability to make people comfortable at end of life. And I think that is, um, and I think that is important, but I will also say that there's a lot of people who at end of life, they want to be present for their family members. And it's probably a lot like birth, you know, birth, we can medicate heavily birth and you can have a healthy baby. And that's the same with death. But I think that, you know, when you can be present to your family members and you can at least be as present as possible um, and that we can find other ways to kind of relieve, and I'm not talking pain. I think sometimes it's, you know, pain, we have excellent ways to address the pain. I think it's much more about our mental state because a lot of times we have, it's more fear, like dealing with that fear and the loss and um, the impermanence. And mm -hmm. so that is where we, I think, can have other ways of, um, of working with that. And I'm not at all saying I'm against medication. I think medication is, uh, you know, we always say that morphine is the friend of the dying. And I completely believe that. But I also feel like there's times where, um, where helping when you're not in pain with mental and the spiritual component can be very powerful. Well, I think what's come through so strongly in your presentation today, Janet, is intentionality and making um, choices and conscious choices. And so the ways that doulas actually help people make that happen, I think really um, helps us understand, you know, why this is such a vital and growing role. Mm -hmm. Deep bow of gratitude um, mm -hmm. to Janet. This has really been um, a phenomenal presentation. I hope you get a chance to read some of the comments in the chat. People are deeply grateful for your presence mm -hmm. today. 
I want to also acknowledge and thank all of our staff, the Bakken Center, who helped make today's webinar possible. Um, look for the email that Molly um, will be sending out with um, a list of resources. And thanks all of you for being with us today.